good evening everybody it, it gives me great pleasure in welcoming you all to the 35th episode of marvelous medicine on the occasion of doctors day acute kidney injury is defined as an abrupt or rapid decline in renal function aki affects 26 to 67% of critically ill patients and is associated with poor patient outcomes including an approximate doubling of the risk of death in the hospital Perioperative acute kidney injury occurs in 20 to 40% of high risk patients and the combination of sepsis and kidney injury is associated with the 70% mortality is likelihood of mortality and so preventing and treating acute kidney injury is essential to improve outcome in surgical patients the professor of medicine at columbia university medical center and the clinical director of nephrology division at the new york presbyterian hospital he does mbbs and md medicine from jitma pondicherry and is mrcp in uk he did his nephrology training at the massachusetts general hospital in boston and columbia university he completed his masters program in biostatistics from the mailman school of public health columbia university his clinical and research interests are in glomerular glomerular diseases and uh, critical care is an associate editor of kidney international and the founding editor editor in chief of kidney international report as a clinician educator he has served on educational committees with the american society of nephrology and the international society of nephrology also the global education ambassador and like dr muthu mentioned he frequently visits india and he has given several lectures both in india and abroad uh, welcome jay and thank you for accepting the invitation Moderating the session will be Dr. Srinivas Prasad. He is an assistant professor, Department of Nephrology at Stanley Medical College. He is a consultant nephrologist at Fortis Muller and Chettinad Super Specialty Hospital in Chennai. He did his MBBS from Chengalpet Medical College, MD Pediatrics from Jitma Pondicherry, and DM Nephrology from Madras Medical College. He has several publications to his credit, and his special areas of interest are renal transplant and general nephrology. Joining us is a young intensivist from Adelaide, Dr. Tejaswini Murthy. She works at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital at Adelaide and is a PhD candidate in ICU research at the University of Adelaide. She did her MBBS anesthesia from uh, Command Hospital Air Force Bangalore and her uh, IDCCM in, from Columbia Asia Referral Hospital Bangalore. She has several publications and presentations to her credit. She is an undergraduate interviewer for admissions to medical schools, and she is a student mentor for honors and PhD candidates. She is a regular contributor to the Facebook group, the Anesthetist Society, and all the members look forward to her um, blogs. Uh, welcome, all of you, and the over to you, Jay. Good. Can you, you can see my slides, correct? Yes, and we can hear you well. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you once again for the invitation, and thanks to Vidya and Radha Krishnan for. Actually, organizing this, I must say, difficult uh, endeavor, but we're all here together, and hopefully, we can share our knowledge and uh, take away something from this presentation. So, just to give you a brief background on why nephrology, I remember, I, so I'm from the batch of '77, so you can see the gray hair, and uh, I remember Professor Surange who used to teach us physiology, and uh, the the biggest reason for attending classes was the air conditioning. <laughs> in Jitma. And so one day I sort of heard Dr. Sarangi and I woke up and I said, hey, this, this is really interesting. So his entire course was done by diagrams. And consequently, my entire test was just a series of diagrams and I aced it. And I said, nephrology is for me. So that, that was my interest in nephrology. It was very intuitively sort of driven and it's driven by mechanisms. And, I, uh, and that's the reason why I'm here. So just to give you a little background, you know, I do a lot of work with critically in, in, uh, ill patients here in, uh, in New York. And uh, one of the things that strikes me is that uh, after 50 years of recognizing this entity, there's not much that we have to offer in terms of uh, you know, real treatment to reverse this condition. So nevertheless, it's, it's very common, like Vidya was saying, and there are some glimmer in the horizon in terms of what we can offer uh, in terms of fine-tuning the care of these patients. So we'll talk about the epidemiology. Um, AKI doesn't stand alone. It's really a part of multi-organ dysfunction. 
then we'll dive straight, uh, straight into the specific syndromes that we see in the very in a variety of uh, critical care settings and a few words on treatment and prevention so this is a definition that's based on outcomes so you need just a bump of 0 0.3 milligrams per ml of creatinine or a doubling of a baseline to sharply increase the mortality and this corresponds also to a reduction in urine volume to 0 0.5 mils per kilo per hour for a six hour period of observation and to to make sure that we have ruled out obstruction and uh, a pre-renal condition these patients need to be adequately fluid resuscitated and you need to be sure that there's no blockage of the urine at any in any part of the urinary tract and uh, a pre-renal condition so you can see the uh, um, increase in serum creatinine this is in millimoles and one millimole is 88 point one milligram is 88.4 millimoles so you can see the mortality right here the odds of uh, of dying goes up from about 10 when this is 0 0.3 um, the incidence is about 10 percent and the odds goes by from about two to four to all the way up to 16 uh, when you see a, a creatinine that's doubled from baseline so this is a very important metric because uh, one would think that you know you need to be at dialysis levels of kidney failure for things to happen but really a small bump in creatinine is enough to dramatically change the outcome there are some stages we don't need to worry about this but these are basically meant to uh, grade the severity of uh, kidney dysfunction in the setting of uh, acute kidney injury so how common is this so this is the best uh, study it is the best study for a number of reasons because it's international and it's uh, uh, representative of a whole bunch of populations uh, including developing middle income and, and uh, you know high income countries so the absolute incidence of kidney dialysis requiring kidney failure or severe AKI, which is arbitrarily defined based on a BUN and urine output is about 6%. And in these 6% of patients, your mortality is a whopping 60%. And you can see that they are for the large part very sick with coexisting problems they have pre-existing ckt they are on mechanical ventilation and they need presses or inotropes so as i mentioned uh, aki doesn't stand alone uh, so if you look at multi-organ dysfunction right here um, and see how it correlates with aki so you don't typically get multi-organ dysfunction in the absence of aki but with aki 70 percent of patients have multi-organ dysfunction so it occurs almost simultaneously when AKI is diagnosed. So it's a package, it doesn't stand alone. And there's some very interesting phenomena. If I take a mouse and clamp both the kidney arteries, in other words, you've completely nephrectomized the mouse, or you release it after a while, uh, maybe 30 to 45 minutes, uh, and you watch what happens to brain function. So this is a cage where it's crisscrossed by lasers and you see the mouse you can measure the movement so you can see in the sham the mouse wakes up from anesthesia and starts running around very quickly but in any model of aki within you know the moment it wakes up it's basically stopped moving so this is well before the bun creatin goes up so this is not uremic encephalopathy this is something that aki produces which directly affects brain function the same thing you can see within five hours you you have essentially a non-functional uh, GI tract and you can see the extravasation of methylene blue into the GI tissue so something's going on which disrupts the intestinal blood barrier and you can see in a, in a microscopic level there's inflammation and there's necrosis and you can see that uh, patients who are critically ill look like they have sepsis with you know dropping blood pressures increasing white count but you culture them um, again and again, you find nothing. And it's really because of translocation of GI organisms and endotoxin because of this disruption of the barrier. And this leads to the increased uh, you know, mortality, as you can see. So you can make a big list of what goes wrong within a few hours of AKI. Every single organ is affected. And this is the uh, package that we call multi-organ dysfunction. And the unifying hypothesis is that the moment you lose kidney function, there's a sharp uptick in inflammatory cytokines that is disruptive to organ function and leads to organ dysfunction. 
and thereby the mortality is sky high in patients with AKI. And the same story goes with any organ dysfunction. Patients with heart failure have kidney dysfunction, patients with liver dysfunction have heart failure, and so on and so on. So let's dive into the AKI syndromes, and we'll go by ICUs. So let's look at the CCU. And these are patients who are admitted with uh, acute heart failure or decompensated heart failure. And you see what happens to their uh, uh, kidney function. So these are patients with no kidney dysfunction at the time of admission. But shortly after admission, within less than a week, 30% of patients will experience worsening kidney function. So you might say, oh, we have diuresis these patients, and this is the reason. But actually, it's something more complicated. So the traditional teaching is in heart failure, the kidney starts dropping function because we think it's because of hypoperfusion from a drop in cardiac output. And of course, there's a neurohumoral uh, activation in response to this drop in cardiac output. So you get vasoconstriction, and both these combined uh, produces the acute kidney injury. But it's it's really the very simplistic way of looking at it because the vast majority of such patients who are admitted have a small drop in cardiac index, but a massive upregulation of the humoral, humoral mechanisms. So your blood pressure and cardiac index may be just fine, but they are truly vasoconstricted. But what is more important is that these patients have venous congestion. And if you look at right heart cath numbers uh, in patients who are admitted with decompensated heart failure, and you see which quartile of abnormality correlates with worsening kidney function, the striking abnormality is right heart pressure, CVP. So if you see CVP is above 24, about 80% of these patients have worsening kidney function versus a low CVP. And none of the other parameters, the uh, cardiac index, systolic blood pressure, wedge pressure, none of these can predict what's happening in terms of uh, patients who are experiencing worsening kidney function. So it turns out that this elevation of right-sided pressures actually feeds directly into the renal vein, and that induces an intrarenal vasoconstriction. And the treatment is not to cut back on diuretics, but to actually increase diuretics and try to bring the CVP back towards you know, a near normal number. And it's been shown that such patients actually do better with decongestion rather than withdrawal of decongestion. And there's certainly no role of inotropes in these patients because of the fact that their cardiac index does not predict uh, the uh, onset of worsening kidney function. How about hepatorenal syndrome? One needs to have certain well-defined criteria, and these patients have cirrhosis, but very importantly, they need to have ascites. And they have some degree of AKI, and, and these are just the same stages that we had shown in the earlier part of the talk. And the most important part of the um, definition is that these patients need to be volume loaded with a specific dose of albumin and then rule out the other reasons for kidney dysfunction, including shock nephrotoxins and intrinsic kidney disease. So why does this happen? If you look at cirrhosis, there's an elevation of portal pressures because of a reduction of the splanchnic bed. The splanchnic vessels then undergo a compensatory dilatation at the expense of arterial volume. So this then sets up a second wave of hemodynamic events, which is systemic and especially renal vasoconstriction. And that's an extreme form of pre-renal azotemia. It's called hepatorenal syndrome. So the treatment is essentially liver transplant. Everything else is really interim. Uh, we might support patients who are waiting for the liver transplant with uh, real replacement therapy, but to temporize we try to sort of address these two issues, splanchnic vasodilatation and arterial underfilling with a combination of vasopressors and albumin. So the vasopressors that are available are IV vasopressin, norepinephrine, and if you're on the floor, you can use a combination of octreotide and mitotrine. And this should always be done in conjunction with albumin to obviate the arterial underfilling that occurs. So it's not very successful. Maybe 30 to 40 percent of patients might reverse temporarily and eventually will, will crash again. Now, the area that's of <clears throat> great interest to me is contrast nephropathy because I spend a lot of time in, in the uh, cardiac ICU. We have a service called the Nephrocardiac Consult Service, which focuses specifically on patients in the cardiac ICU. And we see a lot of such patients. So when you give arterial contrast, it goes right into the blood vessels of the kidney. It induces renal vasoconstriction. But that's not all. It is actually directly nephrotoxic. So it's a one-two 
hit, which leads to um, a cessation of renal function, uh, usually temporarily, most patients recover, <clears throat> but those patients who are at the edge of CKD, chronic kidney disease, might not recover and might end up needing dialysis. So what are the risk factors? So it's clear that arterial contrast is much more than venous contrast, say with a CT uh, or scan of the abdomen with contrast. But clearly what, is, what determines really the, the biggest risk factor is the volume of contrast, because that's really the only thing you can uh, you know, change or, or, or modify. Uh, this is obviously the based on the level of kidney function. So the lower the kidney function and the higher the level of contrast, the higher the risk of contrast nephropathy. So there are many online risk calculators. You can use something called the Mehran calculator. Roxana Mehran was a, a cardiologist here at Columbia, and she made this uh, multi-variable model, risk model. So you can go from low to intermediate to high. There's nothing extra you need to do in terms of low and intermediate. But for the high risk, <clears throat> we should try to use alternate imaging. Not possible in many patients with um, angiography. So the idea is to make sure that their volume replete pre procedure and nothing else really helps. Bicarbonate and acetylcysteine have all shown to be really not beneficial. So the two things we do is we bring them to the cath lab. And this is a study from our uh, interventionists. So we put in a right, a right sided catheter and measure the, uh, the wedge pressure, the LV and diastolic pressure. And based on the level of the endostolic pressure, we give a dose of saline that's continued throughout the, throughout the case and for six hours afterwards. And you can see that the risk of major adverse events, which is a composite, was much lower in the guided group. Uh, so was death and MI. The need for dialysis, although lower, was not statistically significant because the event rate was not that high. But clearly, this is something we do routinely in the high-risk patients. And the second is to limit the volume of contrast. And we do this by using something called intravascular ultrasound. So you can see in a study called the Jupiter study, the volume of contrast went down from a median of 65 down to 20 um, <clears throat> in these patients. And a rule of thumb is if you take the GFR and you take the reciprocal of the GFR, that should be the, con oh, actually the, the volume of the contrast should be no higher than the GFR if possible. So if your GFR is 20, Try not to use more than 20 ml of contrast. So these are some of the uh, studies that we had published on our experience using low contrast volume with intravascular ultrasound. And the way it's done is <clears throat> you, you use a tiny volume of contrast, about 5 to 10 ml, just to outline the coronary arteries. And you put in a guide wire, which uh, then provides an anatomical map. And you can measure from the guide wire how where these... Uh, 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 where, where the, exactly these uh, lesions are by using intravascular ultrasound. You can see this is the proximal lesion, this is the distal lesion. The approximate size is about 4.5 millimeters. And you go back in either the same time or it can come back in the, the next time with zero contrast. And using the same technique, you can put in a drug eluting stent right here and it's reached a target uh, diameter of seven to nine millimeters. So no contrast, no risk of AKI using uh, intravascular ultrasound. So coming to the MICU, medical ICU, uh, we occasionally see patients with allergic interstitial nephritis. The quote-unquote triad is almost never seen. So if you see a rising creatinine in the setting of uh, fever, skin rash, uh, eosinophilia, any of these components, one should suspect uh, interstitial nephritis. And these are the drugs, typically penicillins. Uh, good news is that it's reversible, but in our experience, we usually try to give them glucocorticoids because especially if you have pre-existing chron uh, chronic kidney disease, there may be irreversibility in some patients. So if no contraindications, we do advocate the use of corticosteroids. And then we have sometimes resorted to giving, doing a biopsy to make sure that we do not uh, miss other etiologies of kidney dysfunction before you slam them with steroids. A 10 to 14 dose, a day dose is enough of a milligram per kilo. The other under-recognized uh, uh, cause for AKI is crystal AKI. So crystals like uric acid and tumor lysis or oxalate with ethylene glycol uh, toxicity and a whole bunch of drugs which are poorly soluble may crystallize in the urine, causing obstruction. But more importantly, they can enter the parenchyma, causing an inflammatory uh, uh, process, which sometimes is not fully reversible. So the important thing is to prehydrate these patients who are at risk uh, 
And if they do experience AKIs to switch to alternate drugs and definitely stop the drug at this time. <clears throat> this is a patient <clears throat> where a kidney transplant came out of the OR with no urine volume and didn't recover for two days, did a biopsy. And we saw these little vacuoles inside the tubules. And the pathologist calls and said, you know, what is the source of osmotic agents that this patient received? And we scanned the charts, we found nothing. The patient did not receive contrast, mannitol, um, or IVIG, which sometimes contains sucrose. But in looking at the anesthesia charts, the patient actually was given hydroxyethyl starch as a volume expander. And that drug right now is not used to expand volume because of the quite high risk of AKI, especially in patients with the tenuous uh, volume status in terms of pre-renal because it does cause uh, uh, kidney injury by being absorbed by the proximal nephron and not being metabolized. So it causes disruption of lysosomes and uh, kidney dysfunction. This patient actually took a long time to recover uh, and did not come back to a baseline that was satisfactory. The other sort of uh, category of AKI is uh, uh, heme pigment induced AKI. And you can see this with rhabdomyolysis, which can be traumatic. And if you have a trauma patient with uh, rhabdo, the most important point is to start the hydration well before the patient reaches the emergency room because that is life-saving and kidney-saving. And the same goes for intravascular hemolysis. The moment you suspect it, start your IV saline um, to make sure that the, um, there's adequate volume flowing through the kidney. Many of these patients have volume depleted and are vasoconstricted, which is what heme does. And is, it is also directly nephrotoxic. So volume, volume, volume is the only method of prevention and treatment. So nephrotoxic AKI can occur with aminoglycosides classically, but in the ever-expanding time of multidrug resistant organisms, we use polymyxins, and, and it's a little less with liposomal AMPO-B, but it is still seen. So what is the giveaway is that since it's a tubular toxin, you lose magnesium and potassium. So typically you don't see low mag and low K with most cases of AKI, but with these toxins, these patients make a lot of urine and lose these electrolytes. So that's the way you suspect it. It takes time because these are cumulative toxins. It takes about at least seven days. And the good news again is if you recognize and stop them, you will get a recovery of kidney function, usually to baseline after up to three weeks. And they rarely need dialysis. The role of trough levels of gentamicin is debated. The role of once daily dosing is also debated. So these are not uh, completely protective, but it's important to look for the creatinine in patients who are on these drugs and stop the drug or move to alternate drugs as soon as you can. This is a very vexing problem, uh, sepsis-induced AKI. And the reason why it happens is not just shock. So these are the kidney tubules and this white substance is fluorescein. And you can see in a normal rat, it stays within the perivascular, uh, peritubular capillaries. The moment you have sepsis within an hour, it starts leaking everywhere. So there is a microvascular compromise. You can see right here, because of this leak, intravascular volume gets reduced. And despite the absence of shock at the level of tissue, you're not seeing perfusion. And the second wave is inflammatory injury to the kidney tubules. And then the patient goes into true kidney failure. So what is being recognized in increasingly is that early onset of what we call the sepsis bundle can be life and organ saving. And this is based on measurement of organ perfusion by looking at the lactate level and using the lactate level to target your efficacy of resuscitation. So patients come in, they get a lactate, they get blood cultures, immediately give broad spectrum antibiotics based on your local antibiogram. And you need to give a fixed uh, specific dose, 30 mils per kilo of crystalloids. And I'll tell you about what the best crystalloid is. And you need to target blood pressure, MAP above 70, 65 to 70, and a lactate above, has to go below four millimoles per liter. We uh, advocate early use of vasopressors. If you're not able to maintain a blood pressure or lactate level resolution, despite aggressive volume resuscitation. So it doesn't make sense to keep pouring in fluid because there's a consequence to that as we'll discuss later and early use of presses is strongly advocated so a little word about covid so our group did a, a, a meta-analysis of 13,000 patients with covid 19 
And if you look at the uh, prevalence of AKI, it's about 17%. And in patients who are hospitalized in the ICU, uh, it's as high as 77%. And your rate of your mortality when you get AKI, uh, especially with RRT, is 50%. So uh, it is not a good you know, uh, outcome when you are in an ICU uh, needing ventilation and you get AKI. These patients don't typically survive. The good news is that if you do survive, your chance of actually recovering kidney function is quite high. So these are the patients who survived, and uh, 55 days after starting dialysis, only about 10% needed uh, some form of renal replacement therapy. So coming to the uh, post-cardiac uh, ICU, so surgical or uh, uh, um, cardiothoracic ICU, the chance of getting AKI depends on the type of procedure that you're receiving on bypass. So if it's a cabbage only, uh, it's about uh, 3 to 4%, 1% need dialysis. So when you go to combination surgeries like uh, cabbage valve and maybe root replacement, it can be as high as 10% with about 5% needing dialysis. So what drives perioperative AKI with bypass? So there's a whole bunch of factors. It's important to recognize that preoperatively, the um, patient needs to be optimized. So you see high-risk patients. There are several risk scoring systems for AKI. Preload optimizing is critical. So these patients should probably get a right heart uh, catheter and then optimize them before going into the surgery. And you should definitely avoid nephrotoxins. So and many patients get contrast, and the next day they get a bypass surgery. That's not a good idea. One should separate high-risk patients by at least two weeks, if not longer, if unless it's a true emergency. During surgery, there's an inflammatory response to the membrane of the bypass machine, which can, as we saw, can cause multi-organ dysfunction. You can get emboli, especially small emboli going to the kidneys. There's a lot of hemodynamic alterations, and there's pigment nephropathy, because using a cell saver without washing, you get hemolyzed or red cells causing heme pigment-induced injury. So the idea is to keep the hemoglobin high, uh, at least seven, if not eight, because you are diluting the uh, blood on the bypass machine. So it's critical to keep it above seven. Your MAP should be at 65 to 70. Your flow rate should be 2.2 to 2.5, and obviously minimize time. Now, people have looked at off-pump versus on-pump, and there's no clear benefit in terms of kidney injury. Uh, we have evidence for and against this. Um, so it's not sort of um, universally acknowledged that that works. And postoperatively, it's really your your incidence of AKI is heavily dependent on how you do it hemodynamically and ideas to optimize hemodynamics again post-pump. So there's some data that uh, Presidex, Dex, metatomidine, which is a um, sedative agent, actually protects against uh, AKI, and so does propofol. Uh, so these uh, drugs are actually um, antioxidants, and they might sort of help patients at high risk for AKI from, uh, from this complication. So if you look at the top causes in, in, in the MICU, it's septic shock. Any major surgery is what's causing AKI and surgical ICUs and cardiogenic shock in the CCU. So when you look at novel therapeutics, uh, so what's in the pipeline? So this is an interesting uh, phenomena. So if you do what's called remote ischemic preconditioning, and what this does is you take a blood pressure cuff and occlude the arterial supply to the limb. So it's a five-minute occlusion, and then you release for five minutes, and then you do it again. So do three cycles, and then see what happens. So the idea is that an ischemic tissue actually liberates mediators that changes your energy met metabolism in other tissue, for example, the heart and, and the kidney, and prevents the uh, excessive utilization of energy. So you downregulate your energy needs in the tissue in response to this ischemia. And really, there's no downside unless, of course, you forget to deflate. But it is a zero-risk procedure, and it potentially has some positive effects. And you can see right here in a uh, model of contrast nephropathy, you can see the risk of contrast nephropathy is much lower in patients with um, all patients and patients, especially with lower GFRs, in terms of the risk for contrast nephropathy. And the same was seen in uh, in patients who underwent cabbage. You can see with ischemic preconditioning, your odds ratio is lower of uh, experiencing AKI. Uh, 
So we always talk about stem cells. This is a study that we did a few years ago. You know, the idea is you put in a catheter into the aorta um, and you deliver stem cells above the diaphragm. So, I did, so you get a high load of stem cells into the kidney. But unfortunately, this, this study could not be completed because of poor recruitment. And in, in the few patients that did receive the, um, the stem cells, there's really no difference in the rate of kidney recovery in patients who have undergone cabbage. So the other thing that we're trying right now is patients who are on CRRT can be immunomodulate. And the way we do this is in a CRRT cartridge, uh, which is put in um, you know, a series. You put stem cells on the outside of the cartridge. And the idea is that it releases, uh, I'm going to say, pro-healing uh, or anti-inflammatory cytokines, which promotes tissue healing. And this is was interrupted by the COVID epidemic, and we are going to hopefully start this again. And the endpoint is really to measure uh, cytokines pre and post uh, administration of this cartridge with uh, mesenchymal stem cells. So a few words on renal replacement. So should we start early? Should we wait for an indication? And does it make a difference? So this is a well-designed trial, the Akiki trial, that showed that early starts based on a stage of kidney failure that is KD go three in patients who are on vent pressures of both were at high risk did not make any difference compared to patients in whom you'd start RRT uh, based on indications like hyperkalemia volume and, uh, and such like that you would normally start patients on. And of course the need for dialysis is much higher in the early starts because you obviously would start and it's difficult to stop dialysis in these patients. So really no advantage. Um, in another trial, smaller trial, single center in France, which used a slightly different uh, entry criteria. So earlier stage, and they used a biomarker called NGAL that we had previously developed about 10 years ago as a marker of early injury. So here, early RRT was associated with a uh, improved outcome. So the jury is still out saying, should we start early or not? But clearly the most important thing, as we'll see, is is, is in, in critically ill patients, one really needs to prevent volume overload. And if you see that the patient's approaching uh, some criteria of volume overload, despite adequate urine output, at least my own uh, preference is to start them earlier than wait for something, you know, like a rising FiO2s or hyperkalemia to happen. Okay, so fluid management. Um, so there's one underappreciated uh, phenomena that happens when you're using large volume uh, resuscitation. So you take a patient with 15 liters of extracellular fluid volume and you flood them with isotonic saline and you give them five liters. What you notice is although the sodium chloride doesn't change because you know, you're replacing identical uh, concentrations, but your bicarbonate levels drop. And this phenomenon is called dilutional acidosis. You can see a drop in pH. So you might say, so what if your bicarb drops from uh, 24 to 18? It turns out that it does impact kidney perfusion. So if you lay, if you choose what's called a balanced solution, and plasma light has um, uh, acetate uh, as a replacement uh, for bicarb, so it generates bicarb, so you don't lose bicarb. So your bicarb level is normal. Versus saline, you see a sharp drop in renal perfusion in a dog experiment. So the question is, can we use this clinically, and does it make a difference? So this was a, a trial done at Vanderbilt. Um, one month they used balanced crystalloids, either Ringer's lactate or this solution called plasma light. And the second month they used saline in all ICUs. And you can see that the bicarbonate level was preserved at normal levels with the balanced crystalloids and not so with saline. How about outcomes? So you can see the um, uh, risk of AKI, AKI, so balance better, saline better. And you can see in sepsis where the highest volumes of crystalloids being used, it has a clear benefit in terms of balanced solutions. So your number needed to treat is about 90. So if every patient you treat, uh, every 90 patients you treat, one will benefit, but really cost is equivalent in terms of saline versus balanced crystalloids and the outcome is uh, much better, especially in sepsis. So volume overload. So you take patients who um, gain 10% or more compared to those who do not gain or lose. And you look at patients on dialysis in black versus not dialyzed, and you see the mortality. So as your volume gets higher and higher, 20, from 0 to 10 to 
your mortality actually spikes up quite a bit in dialysis patients with increasing volumes of fluid that is being accumulated. And this is a trial that was done in ARDS patients where they used a conservative therapy uh, strategy where diuretics were used to prevent volume overload versus a, a liberal management. So you, you were allowed to give whatever volume uh, you would need or you would be thought to need. And you can see the difference in volume at the end of the study period, which is a week. So no change in volume. And the, the, I'm sorry. Sorry? Okay. Uh, whereas the uh, liberal fluid were up by almost seven to eight liters. So big change in the amount of volume. So I'm not going to go into details, but you look at every organ uh, which is affected by volume overload. They do, the organ doesn't do well. Okay. You, you essentially reduce organ dysfunction, and this is especially true with the kidneys. So we try not to cross the 10% threshold in our AKI patients. And if you do, despite adequate diuresis or optimal diuresis, we start them on CRT or uh, hemodialysis. So one underappreciated fact is that people are afraid of using pressors because it might cause worsening kidney function. And that's clearly not the case. You can see uh, when you restore the MAP towards a higher number with norepinephrine, your renal blood flow improves and your renal vascular resistance actually does not increase, which you'd expect, and a GFR actually gets better. So early use of pressors is once again very important. And comparing noradrenaline with dopamine, uh, clearly noradrenaline is a winner in terms of urine volumes compared to dopamine. So dopamine is, is not a drug that we should use unless uh, nothing else is available. Norepinephrine does need a central line, um, but we can use phenylephrine, which is a pure alpha. Uh, compared to dopamine, where the bear effects can actually be harmful because of arrhythmias. So we need a package. And the KDGO, which is the guideline committee that we're part of, has put together a package where, which says you try to avoid nephrotoxin. You stop your ACE or ARBs for at least 48 hours before a procedure or in the face of anticipated AKI. Closely monitor kidney parameters and avoid hyperglycemia, because all these have been noted, uh, known to affect uh, uh, organ dysfunction. And if available, use a uh, hemodynamic monitoring. And there are several systems out there if available. And you look at your um, uh, vast systemic vascular, uh, the, the, the degree of volume depletion, and that's done by stroke volume variation on these, on these little catheter uh, techniques. You optimize cardiac index, you optimize MAP, and you if you don't achieve the goal, you go back and do the same thing uh, iteratively. So, and if you gained the goal, you keep monitoring every three hours and see what happens. So if you use a package, you can see that all AKI as well as moderate and severe AKI are, you know, um, much higher in control versus the, in the units that use the package. So if you're able to package everything into one unit, it's clearly has shown to be beneficial in reducing the rate of uh, at least the severe AKIs and to some extent all AKIs. So to conclude, AKI is common and it has a high mortality. There is nothing consistent. So you have to really personalize strategies. Uh, the easy ones are hemodynamics and limiting nephrotoxins. RIPC, uh, remote ischemic preconditioning, holds promise. And it's really not that uh, uh, dangerous. And once you have established AKI, um, uh, our fluid protocols have to be really standardized in our units, and the early use of pressures is highly, highly suggested, especially in the stepsis bundle. And I think that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Over to you, Tejaswini and um, Srinivas Prasad. Uh, Srinivas, your camera is not on, I think, so you can start, uh, Tejaswini. Uh, yeah, your voice is not clear. All right. Uh, do I? Better now. Right. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Jai, for a wonderful presentation. I think I had made some uh, evidence-based notes based on the studies that have happened in critically ill, and you've covered most of them. So I'm pretty happy that I did my homework well. So um, there were a few things which, um, as an intensive care person, I would like to know from you uh, with regards to evidence um, about 
what modality of uh, renal replacement therapy is um, preferred, especially in AKI and critical illness. In Australia, we regularly use uh, CRRT, and I'm sure that must be the case. But with regards to you, um, uh, availability of personnel and um, availability of um, the machines and stuff, would you, is there any benefit of using intermittent hemodialysis versus CRRT? Yeah, it's a good question. So it's all resource driven. So there were studies from, say, Vietnam, where in the setting of malaria AKI, uh, they used peritoneal dialysis, acute peritoneal dialysis, and it showed to be equally effective when you compare to hemo, because PD is uh, very easy to start. It doesn't need uh, experienced personnel. You can do it on the bedside. So starting from that, you know, P and we, I used to use PD when I was training early on. I used to put my own catheters, and, uh, and, and patients were critically ill because we didn't have CRT, and uh, it worked okay. It wasn't great, but it worked okay. Kept the potassium down. There was some improvement in volume. And then you go to the next level is you, can, you have hemodialysis, but you do not have CRRT. But we cannot use hemodialysis in a patient on two presses and, you know, an ionotrope whose FIO2 is, 50, is, is 80%. Um, for a three-hour treatment because they're getting four to five liters each day and there's no hope we can pull this off uh, with every other day or every or three times a week dialysis. So what we do is what's called SLED. SLED is, stands for Sustained Low Efficiency Dialysis, but it, you have to lock up a dialysis nurse for six to seven hours every single day to be able to pull that volume off uh, gently. So in our institution, we don't have that luxury, and most of the very busy, you know, ICUs and you know, centers which with a large volume of patients, we cannot use uh, hemodialysis because of a lack of personnel uh, who can stay with the patient for seven hours. But it's it's equivalent in terms of hemodynamic um, stability and effic you know efficacy of removal of volume and toxins. So that's the next level, and then the third, of course, is is a continuous renal replacement therapy. It's it's elegant. It's it, the side effects are minimal. It's, it's essentially re related only to uh, the placement of the catheter. If you have a good catheter, this this system goes on indefinitely without a problem. We have protocols in place for anticoagulation, which prevents uh, systemic anticoagulation using regional citrate. So it's reached a, a level of efficiency. All patients have BU BUN of ten and a creatinine of. 0.8, right? So, and a key that's normal. So it works very well, but it's extremely expensive. And I mean, it, it does require one-on-one -on -one nurse, uh, an uh, ICU nurse doing this procedure. So it, it, for those reasons, it's very expensive, but it's very effective. And it's probably the only thing you can do in the most critically ill patients. Unfortunately, it doesn't change outcome. So your mortality is still 70% when you reach that level of kidney dysfunction. Uh, uh, yeah. You go, Governor. No, Dr. Srinivas Prasad. Good evening, sir. Uh, it was a pretty marvelous presentation, uh, definitely. Um, I learned a lot. Uh, sir, uh, the question might be very naive. How do you assess uh, the volume status in the ICU? Yeah. So I get that, that's, a topic, that, that's the topic of my next talk, but yeah, you're right. It's, it's, it's a challenging thing. Okay. So, so, so th there are three avenues that you can explore. I think the easiest is what I'd mentioned is your Delta weight from the time of admission to the time of evaluation. So if you're above 10%, you're clearly in the volume overload category and start being careful and start being conservative. The challenge is volume depletion. So if you look at uh, static measurements, right? So a static measurement is things like blood pressure, um, uh, putting in a pulmonary artery line, CVP. So it, you take a snapshot, but it doesn't tell you if you're going to be volume responsive or not, right? So that is the challenge that we have with traditional methods of measurement. So what's now come into place is what's called dynamic measures of measurement. And here we uh, calibrate a measurement with a fluid challenge and then you say look in a person who responds in terms of cardiac output or uh, you know change in uh, uh, mean arterial pressure does this measurement really predict uh, volume responsiveness so really the the, the, the assessment of volume in, in terms of potential volume depletion is not whether you're volume depleted but whether you're volume responsive 
So there are a few things you can do in a patient that's uh, not intubated. You can do what's called straight leg raising. So when you raise the leg 45 degrees, it puts about uh, one unit of packed cells into your system. And the studies have used traditionally invasive measures of cardiac output, but you can just look at the MAP and see if there's a there's a rise in your uh, MAP. And then if, if there's no rise, it's unlikely that the patient's going to respond to more volume. So you, it's, it's, you know, it can be more conservative at that point. But there's a rise, you can give them a bolus of, uh, of volume and then see if that corresponds to your uh, pre prediction uh, based on the st straight leg raising. In intubated patients, we use a, you know, the positive pressure to predict uh, changes in the cardiac output. And you can do pulse uh, wave variation. And that uh, many monitors can actually calculate it uh, algorithmically. Um, the other thing you can do is you can, if you have an echo, you can look at IVC distension. So if there's a non-collapsible IVC, that's a sign of volume overload. There's collapse and there's certain numbers, 30, 40% based on what numbers, you, what study you look at. That's a, that could be a predictor of, uh, of uh, volume responsiveness. Um, the others I've, sh I've shown you that you can use that PICO system, which uses multiple inputs to predict uh, volume responsiveness based on stroke volume variation and cardiac index. So it's it's a it's a very challenging, you know, field and and frequently we just resort to giving a bolus of fluid in a patient that's not obviously volume overloaded to see what happens. In sepsis, it's very different. So sepsis lactate is a is a stand, tried and true measure there are some fallacies with with lactate but you know in, in a in early resuscitation of sepsis one does need, need to use lactate and map as a measure of uh, of uh, resuscitation even for a passive uh, leg raising test i need an arterial line and no yeah that's right so it's it's not easy so the, you know luckily most icus will have an art line and uh, you cannot do this with non in non invasive monitoring there's no way so but the bet, uh, it increasingly we're using um, you know the combination of uh, of the b lines on the lung uh, ultrasound and the okay. ivc uh, as a as a measure of overload and ivc collapsibility as a, as a measure of volume you know uh, responsiveness and that's if you gain that technique it's easy echo is not that great you know we, we tried using echo but it, you you have to be really skilled at an echo and it's we, we don't recommend using an echo to predict uh, volume responsiveness uh, dr ilango is uh, the surgeon and uh, he's very active on uh, learning general surgery and very much interested in organ system so dr Lango, do you have a question for jay yeah <clears throat> mine is a little surgically oriented sir um is there um i mean for for surgeons uh who who want the nurses to measure the urine output like hourly or sixth hourly for a routine surgery what's your take on that do you think we'll get any information out of it or are we just following time tested or established uh, principles without questioning them. No, no. So this urine volume is a critical test that we, we, we strongly, strongly advocate. And, you know, and I, if you remember the first slide, I mean, you can just Google KDGO, uh, kidneys, kidney fail, you know, uh, AKI stages. So if you're crossing, uh, you know, the lowest into the higher stages based on urine volume, you know, you're, you have to be hundred percent sure that your uh, hemodynamics are perfect. You know, because these patients, when they leave the OR, are going to run into problems in the post-op period. So the urine volume is the first indication that there's going to be a problem with uh, with kidney function. And 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 the anesthesiologist usually, if I'm not mistaken, is is really taking care of this, as is the perfusionist. So your entire uh, um, uh, data management is is does and should include urine volume measurements, hourly urine volume. Or actually, even you can do this half hourly also to correlate. That's very, very important aspect of management. What's the role of routinely measuring uh, urea, creatinine, and electrolytes in a surgical patient? So, you know, so the most important is pre-op. You know, pre, pre so if you've got patients with CKD, they are going to be at higher risk for acute kidney injury. The problem with uh, post-op measurement of creatinine is that it's not a very uh, sensitive test of kidney function like the urine volume is. And the reason is because when you volume resuscitate patients and they're getting a lot of volume in the OR, you're actually diluting the uh, production of the, the levels of creatinine. So despite your production rates being constant, your rise will not be as brisk as it will be with a patient who's euvolemic, right? So 
we almost never look at the creatinine in the first 24, 48 hours as an absolute number, unless, of course, it goes up. But we, if it does not go up, it doesn't mean that the patient's in AKI. But uh, so the main reason I would say in pre-ops is, is to risk stratify them. And uh, if I would strongly recommend bringing a nephrologist on board in such patients, if they, especially the GFR is under 30, because uh, they may have to be managed, especially in the post-cardiac situation, in a, you know, with, with more in, in sort of intensive monitoring of kidney parameters. The uh, third question is about volume overload in the presence of sepsis. Like if your lactates have come down, you've optimized the hemodynamics, would you recommend using a diuretic to pull off fluid at that point of time? Yeah, so that's a loaded question. So um, one, one needs to be sure your volume overloaded. That's the first thing, right? So, you know, usually little edema is not a big deal. But, you know, if your central pressures are high, you know, you really have to bring bring down the uh, the volume. And, yeah, we use diuretics all the time. So there's this, uh, you know, I've seen this in a lot of publications. There's this triple, the three-phase uh, aspect of sepsis, right? So the phase of resuscitation. There's a phase of stabilization and there's a phase of recovery. So typically during the first phase, the volume, you know, intravascularly depleted, then they get euvolemic as the tissue stores of volume get, you know, mobilized back into the circulation. And during the third phase, they actually get a clinical volume overloaded. So the best way to know what's if when they hit that stage is your pressure requirements go down, right? Your MAP start to go up and your FIO2 if you're on a vent starts to climb and that's the time you want to hit them with diuretics without any hesitation during the first phase no during the second phase of equilibration you you want to be really careful the only time i do this is when your lungs are at risk so if your your fio2 is steadily going up and many of them are on crt and i, and I dial up the uh, you know the volume the ultra filtration on crt even at the at the expense of a slightly higher pressure requirement because at that stage actually volume is extremely bad okay so a little bit of little ex, little you know higher pressure requirements is not a big deal you to get the volume off so you definitely don't want a 80 percent fio2 situation if you can prevent it right because that's that's bad news can i add one more question if i yeah. if i can yeah uh, last, last question Ilango. <laughs> okay uh, for um, sick, critically ill patients, uh, one of my nephrology friends always said people will die with renal failure, not because of renal failure. Yeah, uh, and that, that goes back to my observation that it's part of a multi-organ dysfunction package, right? Because, you know, we can treat renal failure, but they still die at 70% rates, right? So it's because everything else goes down the tubes because of this domino effect on organ dysfunction, right? Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Muttu Jairaman, uh, you wanted to say something, ma'am? Yeah, I want to ask you this. Uh, Dr. Jai, very nice uh, lecture. Uh, regarding the cardiorenal syndrome uh, failure, uh, what is the role of three-person saline? Because now they say, besides the diuretics, uh, hypertonic saline is very unusual to load the sodium to uh, already failure. Yes. Cardiac and renal failure patient, but so, that state does uh, good with uh, removing the fluid, extra fluids. So the yeah, the premise is that um, there's, there's a perceived sodium chloride deficit, and so it, it, this is highly controversial. Just for everybody, you know, if you take someone with heart failure, the idea is you diurize them with three percent saline to augment diuresis by raising intravascular volume while the diuretics is going on. So that's the premise of uh, Dr. Jeram's question, right? So this is this is in vogue in Italy and nowhere else in the world, okay? So all the publications have come from Italy. There are no randomized trials. There are no outcome trials. And we've tried it in a couple of patients who, um, who had borderline blood pressures, but it actually made them worse in terms of congestion. So we do not advocate it routinely. There might be a role in patients who are, I'm gonna say slightly hyponatremic just to improve the sodium profile, but again, it's not something that's going to be used routinely in management of patients with cardiorenal syndrome. I think understanding the pharmacokinetics of diuretics is critical. The dose, the duration, the type of diuretics, using sequential diuretics and using an ionotrope when this truly in low output state is the, is the crux of how you manage cardiorenal syndrome. Uh, but, uh, yeah. What is the role of AGL2 inhibitors? 
so that's more like chronic, uh, you know, cardiorenal syndrome, and you know that's that's routinely used in all our patients with CHF. So that's routinely, that, always. So every patient of mine who has, you know, now it's CKD of any cause, and especially you know CHF, uh, it's now the fourth line therapy after ACE or slash ARBs, spironolactone, and Tresto, which is uh, nephrolysis and ARB, and now it's uh, the fourth line is uh, SGLT2. So that's a package we use for heart failures. Do you use it in the sequential diuretic therapy? Not, not for acute diuresis, no. Never for. It's mainly for maintenance in patients with uh, chronic congestive heart failure and chronic CKD. Not, not in, acutely in the hospital. Not in cardiorenal syndrome. Well, well you, you do use it, but not in the hospital. So, supposing someone comes in with decompensated heart failure, the focus is really diuretics, right? When they are stabilized and they're decongested as an outpatient management, we don't use it per se for, it's not a great diuretic because you reach steady state very quickly, but it modifies outcome based on, you know, other signals that is, it, you know, we don't know fully how it works, but, you know, we won't get into that, but it, it improves mortality. Let's just put it that way. It, it removes water. Yeah, it's not the whole story, though. You know, it's it's beyond diuresis, right? It's beyond. You know, you lose about two percent of body weight, but it's that's not enough to explain its uh, positive uh, effects on mortality. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Pajepan, who's uh, who's my batchmate and a nephrologist at Coimbatore, and is uh, involved in renal transplant. Pajepan, would you like to put your question to Jay? Uh, hello, Jay. It's fantastic uh, presentation. Yes, thank, thank you, you. Thank you so much. Very, very. Now, can you put your camera on? Uh, my camera. Yeah, I think it's on now. Yeah, we can see you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, Jay, is there any role of using albumin infusion during uh, dialysis in those patients with the low blood pressure who also happen to have low, low albumin, uh, you know, the septic patients? Yeah, so that's been debated, and, and the answer is probably. So I'm not going to put you know, go out on a limb and say all patients <laughs> with uh, with low albumin and who are hypotensive should be on albumin. It's very expensive, number one. But yeah, it does stabilize hemodynamics during volume removal in patients who are slightly hypotensive. But yeah, yeah, I give you. I I personally do use it, although I won't publicly say that. <laughs> Publicly saying that. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. Dr. Vijay has My a question. Manager uh, will, will, will kill me. <laughs> Dr. Vijay has a question. Can extra volume, extra vascular lung water be used to estimate and predict volume overload in ICU patients with AKI? No, no, we, yes, we absolutely. So we, we are using this quite routinely and it does help. You need to be slightly skilled with the with that little bedside thing we use. But, you know, nowadays it comes in a, you know, we can use it on an iPad or iPhone, you know, this. Uh, this, it's called a butterfly, you know, pro, and it really completely changes the way we look at volume nowadays. So yes, it's very, very useful. But you have to learn the technique. But yet, yeah. Tejeshwini has not completed her questionnaire or not. And she'll also <laughs> look into the chat questions. Give her a chance. Oh, there's a lot. Of, should I look at this or? Yeah, yeah. the Tej will take up. Tej and Srinivas Prasad will do it for you. Okay. Yeah. So we have a question, and this has been on my in my head as well for quite some time, because we get requests from the home team asking us to dialyze patients just because the creatinine has doubled in patients who have come in with pre-renal AKI who who are possibly not making much urine and who are not in fluid overload. They do not have any other indications for dialysis. They have hyperkalemia, which can be rectified with medical measures. And they would be like, no, 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 creatinine is 400. You have to dialyze this patient. So what are your recommendations no, on no, that? Right. So, so I think the, the, the most, so, so these are critically ill or not critically ill patients? That's critically the first question. Ill. Right. So yeah. th those patients, I, I I have a very low threshold to dialyze. So if you're, and I think the, we have to look at a crystal ball. So they're coming in with some, say, sepsis or post, uh, um, post MI, cardiogenic shock, or they come out of the OR on two pressors. So those are the classic situations. And if they're not making urine, um, I generally tend to start very early. In fact, you know, my fellows, I just tell them don't argue because, you know, the, the, the downside of waiting and, and having something go wrong is much worse than starting CRT. Uh, it's not quite preemptive because you know, if you are not expecting the urine volume to go up in the next 24 or 48 hours, you're going to start anyways, right? So you, you have to have a, some sort of a sense of whether there's going to be a recoverable 
you know, AKI or is this patient going to go down the tubes over the next 20 or 40 years? So, and the majority, when they call, you know, I don't try to second guess them. I generally start, you know, um, such patients, especially on CRT. If they are hemodynamically stable, I wait, okay? But if they're on presses, the FI2 is like 40, 50% going up. Uh, they're not making much urine in response to a good dose of diuretics. You know, there's no need to wait. I would just start. Uh, and these are not these, these patients, by the way, were not addressed in the RCTs, right? So you, you yes, cannot I have a to add that like the Akiki trial or the Elaine trial, they all looked at either delayed versus too delayed. Yeah. And the start AKI is what uh, we did in oh. Australia last year and it got published and um, we compared early versus delayed, even though there was not much of a difference, but there was reduction in ICU length of stay and uh, right, hospital. Right, exactly. Length. Right. So, so, you know, my threshold is very low. So you, you have to treat critically ill patients completely different from a floor patient or an outpatient, right? They're not the same bucket. And Dr. Um, Shidibar, do you want to go with the next one? Sir, uh, do you have any different numbers to start dialysis? No, 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 no. We don't. The numbers are completely unreliable and useless in terms of BU and creatinine. No. But, but urine volume is very useful. And, of course, the traditional pH... Uh, potassium and so on, you know, FiO2 um, response to diuretics. So those are some of the, you know, soft criteria we use. But really, you know, you have to put your mind two to three days ahead and see what happens, what is going to happen there. So Sanjeev is a resident in anesthesia and he has a question. To assess early renal derangement, should we stick to routine parameters like creatinine, urea, volume overload, or should we shift to any newer modalities? No, no. So unfortunately, none of the so so we have so we looked at biomarkers. That's been one of our uh, um, you know research aims for the last ten years. And yes, we can predict quite well using NGAL, Kim one, Timp two. All those things are very useful in predicting. But the unanswered question is so what, right? So the so what question is not going to be answered by any measurement. So you have to say if someone's going in for contrast and they get a biomarker only. Um, sign of kidney injury, but the creatinine is normal, is making urine, so what? Are you going to change your management? So that has not been answered. So beyond traditional measurements, I don't think at this time we have um, any use. Yeah, we, we saw one clinical trial where they looked at, you know, um, the, the NGAL levels and put patients with elevated NGAL and KD good stage two into uh, early dialysis. Seemed to make a difference. So that might be a one way to sort of power trials in the future by looking at biomarkers and then if you have a, if you have a technique, for example, stem cells or um, say silencing mRNAs against a certain, you know, um, uh, growth transcription factors that are upregulated in AKI, th that might be the time to start therapies rather than wait when you're on dialysis, which is too late. We have another question from uh, Dr. Heyman. I think it's a very important question. So he is asking whether you recommend frusamide uh, stress test for institution of dialysis. No. <laughs> so, so the so the furosemide stress test is uh, is a measure of uh, what we call uh, tubular responsiveness, right? So, uh, so the way this works is if you if you've got someone with volume overload and his urine output is dropping, so your intake is higher than output. All we do is give them furosemide. You don't have to call it anything fancy, right? So if they respond to furosemide and you are not at risk of dropping intravascular volume, you know, by all means, go ahead and use furosemide if it means staving off dialysis for 24 to 48 hours. But it, it, the, the word stress test has been, you know, I think overused and it's, it's, it doesn't really mean much in, in the overall management of the uh, AKI. Um, the next question is from uh, Dr. Sandeep. He wants to know about the endpoints for stopping CRRT. Uh -huh, okay, <laughs> that's that's a tough one. So what we typically do is um, the cartridge lasts for, for 72 hours on an average, right? So what I've been telling most ICU people is you don't put them right back on CRRT. If they're making, say, you know, five or 10 mLs an hour of urine, just give a large bolus of of furosemide, say 100, 120 milligrams, and see what happens. So if your urine output goes up to 20 to 30, just wait as long as you can before putting them back. So unfortunately, while on the machine, it's very difficult to assess recovery. But uh, typically what happens is once the urine volume starts to go up a little bit, we either stop 
and give LASIK, so it just stop and see what happens, right? There's no other way to tell other than urine volume at this point in time. There's no biomarker. Right. And um, uh, there's another question where they're asking about urinary and blood markers to detect AKI early in the course of ICU. So you have already touched upon it, but yeah. is there any common test that you would order apart from the regular EUCs? No, so the only... Um, only commercial test is that nephrocheck is what we call it. It's it's a combination. It's a ratio of uh, a temp and uh, uh, one of the growth factors. I think I can't remember exactly, but uh, it's really doesn't help us in our in our day to day management. I mean that's a one liner because you know it's it's a so what test, right? You you if it's positive and the creatinine is normal, are you doing anything different? Uh, you're going to hopefully optimize hemodynamics, avoid nephrotoxins. If you're on ACRB, you're going to stop that. So there's nothing else you're going to be doing based on these tests, right, in terms of planning ahead. Um, Dr. Srinivas, did you have any other questions? Um, uh, sir, do you have any experience of using bioimpedance capacity or bioreactants in uh, assessing volume overload in the ICU? Sorry, I missed the... Using what? Uh, bioimpedance. Bioimpedance. Impedance or bioreactance in the bio, ICU. Bio, bio impedance is basically putting electric current from one end of the body to the other and measuring the yeah, resistance, right? That, that is the technique. And bioimpedance has... So the problem with bioimpedance is that it's very difficult to separate intracellular from extracellular volume. What really matters is extracellular volume. And the bioimpedance machines, they, they try to guess it, but the... Uh, the sensitivity and specificity is very, very low. So it'll tell you, yes, there's there's volume overload, right? But it doesn't tell you if it's intra or extracellular volume. And th that's the biggest deficiency of this technique. And it's, for the most part, they use, they use it in outpatients, say on dialysis or yeah. with heart failure, but it's not really been shown to be a benefit in critically ill patients in terms of guessing volume. Uh, Professor Subramaniam wants to ask, Professor Subramanian, please go ahead. Regarding uh, risk stratification, uh, do you use the rifle score still? Uh, you didn't mention about it, but you said risk stratification. I thought we, the old teachers, still tell the students that rifle score is the one. And uh, how do you uh, uh, guide your students these days? Yeah, the, you know, the rifle and the KDGO are very similar. The KDGO is a more recent one, and it's now the universally supported uh, um, you know, score, it doesn't make a big difference. You can use either. It's They're all same. They're highly predictive. Uh, they've, been, they've been validated. The differences are very small. So you can choose either. Rifle is completely fine. The Aiken score you can use, you can use the KDGO score. KDGO is the most recent and uh, it's more universally accepted in clinical trials. So that's the one we would, you know, suggest. But clinically, it's all the same. Very similar. Vidya, Amit Ghosh is there. Ravi Shankar is there. Please let uh, there are know. already some more questions in the chat box. So, Teju, once you are done, we'll... Yeah, yeah. Um, we have a... Oh, sorry, sir. Yeah, you can. Please carry on. Okay. So, we have a question from Ashish, uh, which is not relevant to the critically ill population, but to the post-operation questions. <laughs> so, if the urine output drops less than 30 mils an hour, would you do something? Would you just watch... Or um, is there something that needs to be done immediately in the perioperative period? Oh, uh, no, no. So that's the whole point is, you know, you have to make sure that your hemodynamics are optimized. Make sure the Foley is working, <laughs> first of all. Right? Then you step back and make sure your, uh, you know, your hemodynamics are optimized. If you, you think the volume depleted, give them volume. If you're, if you're in post-operative shock with two pressors and they're coming back from cardiac surgery, you, and they're known to have uh, decreased EF, you might need to start an inotrope. So it's basically about optimizing hemodynamics. That's all. There's nothing magical about this. Uh, there's another question from Dr. Sandeep, but it's more about resuscitation. I think it's a patient with shock on multi-pressor uh, support. 
aneuric and severe uh, lactic acidosis as well how would you approach so possibly it's all about resuscitation if you have anything specific to add well to that call, call the pundits first yeah and then <laughs> then, <laughs> and then we can uh, we can uh, try okay let's, so th this is you know very classic right so people with multi organ failure on max pressors and so th there's nothing you know special so we we have, we have tried to do if you have angiotensin 2 uh, as the uh, as the salvage presser it's it's extremely expensive and it's not widely available you have tried that it it un, uh, unclear if it really affects mortality it seems to affect aki rates in in the small I'm study sorry but to interrupt you sir i was a part of that trial and yes. i actually could make out that it wasn't working so <laughs> Uh, agreed agreed so it's 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 it, this is all magical thinking right so the problem is such a patient is at the last you know leg and uh, yeah. so we, you know we we try to so the, the, for the lactic acidosis it's a ph driven decision to use bicarbonate so we try to keep the ph about 7.25 by giving iv bicarb take off the volume with crrt uh, you know use combination presses make sure they're not uh, this is a time you'd use definitely use steroids if if you haven't done so and uh, and lastly you know if you if you if you missed an organism which might be the cause of sepsis for example you might think of broadening to fun anti fungal or broader spectrum uh, antibiotics right so it's it's all general principles nothing specific here yes, so we have another question from uh, dr muthu um he's asking about the percentage of aki patients who go on to develop chronic kidney disease and if there are any specific predictors to watch for yeah. right that's a, actually a very good question so the, the the there are few so it depends on the substrate on which aki happens so if you're looking at older patients with diabetes and pre existing ckd the chances of recovery is correspondingly lower and the second is the number of episodes of aki so you see diabetics coming in for procedures right they come in they they have an amputation they get contrast they get uh, a sepsis they get shock with each stay which each uh, episode of aki there's less and less recoverability and finally they end up on dialysis so those are some of the case scenarios i can make in terms of uh, um, reversibility and the second is which is underappreciated is even though you recover even completely your one year mortality is still there's a legacy effect on your one year mortality post discharge so it's not as though you know you left the hospital and your kidneys are fine everything's going to be over but your readmission rates your subsequent um uh, uh, outcome is is much poorer than in patients who do not get any care so ravi you want to ask a question uh, ravi shankar yeah hi jay wonderful talk i just had a quick question uh, actually a couple of them uh, one was um, how much does metformin use contribute to these uh, uh contrast induced issues uh, it's so commonly used people even forget that they're on metformin and you know forget to inform their caretakers about that and the second part or second question was you know in ckd people are now looking at the slopes of egfr rather than absolute numbers um to look at progression is there any such thing in aki no so um so aki luckily it's easy it's just how severe right so it's the slope is not that important as as is the severity right and the severity can be easily estimated during your urine volume and your percentage above baseline change of creatinine so that's the one line around aki and prognosis when it comes to metformin metformin doesn't cause kidney injury but if your kidney function drops suddenly while on metformin you can accumulate and you can get lactic acidosis it's still very rare and but all places that use contrast have it on the checklist so when the phone call is made for the appointment they'll say are you on metformin if you are please stop it there are occasional times when it slips up but generally it's it's malpractice of course so people are extremely wary of metformin use in patients coming in for a contrast procedure so luckily it's not that common in but it's extremely common in outpatient akis where patients get volume depleted on an asarbs uh, diuretics and you know sglt2s which they're commonly on the package they get sick they, they forget to stop so this this concept of uh, of a drug holiday is very a sick day rule is very very important so any patient who's who are on any combination of these meds have to be told to stop the meds until they feel better and then resume 
because when they're on this package and the kidney function drops, blood pressure drops, you become metformin toxic, and we get several patients a year with severe lactic acidosis with a 50% mortality. They come in late. So that's a very good point, uh, Woody. I can call you that, right? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Amit, would you sure, like to say something? Amit is yeah, yeah. yeah um, wonderful, Jay. I've been listening to Jay for the last 25 years. Uh, my question to Jay is, there's a substantial uh, knowledge base which is required for critical management of these patients. And number one, are the outcomes dependent on the hospital you're in, which has or which does have or does not have this critical care nephrologist? And number two, like stroke management, should we limit the complex AKI management to, like we do stroke management, the levels of hospitals, level one, not centers, uh, because looks like depending on the knowledge of the doctor uh, and, and the ability of the nursing team and the entire team, the outcomes could be variable. Or do you think the outcomes don't matter if you just follow these evidence-based guidelines? So yeah, that's a great question. So I think the, the problem is that uh, once you get AKI, you know, the horse is pretty much out of the barn, as they say, right? So your outcomes, no matter what you do, at, you know, there, there is a little bit of a difference. If you put the whole package and you have invasive monitoring and you optimize human, you do the best you can. The delta is about 10 or 15%, which, which you know, in, in, if you look at absolute event rates, might be significant. But the amount of work it takes to get there, it's, it's extremely, extremely difficult to, to, to do this in, a, you know, in, a, in an average uh, setting. So the, the best way to sort of avoid this is prevention, right? So you really have to go back and say, does this patient need contrast? Can we limit the volume of contrast with, by using a, an experienced interventional cardiologist, right? Can we promote hospitals using the sepsis bundle? So that by the time we reach the ICU, you know, they're not sort of beyond that, you know, critical sweet spot, right, of, of reversibility. Do we need to go into this high-risk aortic and triple valve surgery in a patient who's 80 years old and, uh, you know, the longevity is limited? So I think these are more important points that are not addressed. But once you have AKI, as we can see, you know, it's pretty much too late, right? And we can try to limit the damage, but... Unless you're young and in excellent shape, you know, as you know, right? You're if you're an older person with multiple comorbids, you you have AKI, your chance of making it out of the hospital is not very high. Tough question. Thanks. Uh, we have a few more questions in the chat. I'm just going to combine the next two questions. Um, one is from Urvashi, who is asking whether um, how would you reduce the chances of AKI in patients on mechanical ventilation? And I'm going to combine it with a question from Dr. Satya Jait, who is asking whether tracheostomy has any impact on AK at all. No, no. So tracheostomy, it's it's it doesn't have any impact. So you can you can safely do a tracheostomy. I'll I'll give you a full endorsement. Okay. So that's an easy one. So the other one's a little more difficult. So people on mechanical ventilation. So if it's a hypoxic ARDS situation, right? Remember that's organ injury leading to organ injury. So the package still stands there, right? Whereas if it's someone with, who comes in with hypercarbic COPD, you know, um, uh, respiratory failure, that's a whole other issue. And if you're hemodynamically stable, that is not associated with AKI. So for the former, the idea is to optimize volume, like we said, you know, we, I showed you the data on the FACT trial. We do not want to overload them. But that is clearly associated with, you know, worsening organ uh, dysfunction. So you want to keep them below that magic 10% of the baseline weight and weighing patients every day on the in the ICU is is extremely important. We cannot get um, weights easily, but if you put it into into your ICU protocol, it completely changes the way you manage volume. So that's a that that I think is a critical part of ventilated patients preventing organ dysfunction is optimizing volume. Of course, you know you don't want them to get hypovolemic. They're in positive pressure ventilation and they are kind of preload dependent. So that sort of is needless to say, you know, you can't be too dry either. But generally, we can tolerate a little bit of hypovolemia, but we cannot tolerate hypervolemia. Um, the next one is from Dr. Partha Sarathi, and uh, he's asking, what is the exact pathophysiological basis of the magic number of 0.5 mils per kg urine output? Okay, that, that's a good question. So it's purely statistics, okay? So that's the, e that's the easy answer. Now, if you want a mechanistic um, answer, so we all 
make uh, a certain number of milliosms per day of, of toxins that need to be secreted. And the maximum that the urine can concentrate is about 1,200 to 1,200 milliosms, which translates to approximately three to 400 mLs of urine as a minimum to excrete volume. So, but again, that's, that's really in more of a chronic outpatient indication to start dialysis. It's an acute indication. It's, all these are statistically driven endpoints, okay? Um, do we have time for more questions, ma'am, or? Uh... Yeah, we, we have, please get it. Okay, excellent. So uh, we have- You guys don't sleep, huh? <laughs> 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 it's, it's not even to get you again. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's not even 9.30 yet, so <laughs> not to worry. Yeah. No. I'm used to night shift, so I'll keep going. Yeah, I think uh, yeah. <laughs> they just uh, passed his heart, almost asleep. <laughs> <laughs> she's looking the brightest. <laughs> yeah. So we have a question from uh, Dr. Damodaran. Do you foresee any role for monoclonal antibodies against inflammatory cytokines in management of AKI secondary to sepsis? Right, so uh, the big problem with sepsis is if you analyze what goes up, it's like a soup. So trying to target one or even 100 of these uh, cytokines is not shown to be of much benefit. Now, what is interesting, however, are these uh, perfusion cartridges, right? Which uh, sucks up a lot of these cytokines. So they've been using these uh, so it's, there's a cartridge that has polymyxin, which essentially uh, adsorbs endotoxin. So there was a, there's a trial going on. I'm not sure how far that's gone, and uh, but the preliminary data seems to be interesting in septic patients. They used uh, <clears throat> alkaline phosphatase to break down, uh, uh, you know, certain adducts that can be pro-inflammatory. That was a negative trial. Um, I cannot think of any other monoclonal antibody, but there are other therapies to take off these, uh, these so-called cytokines that are floating around in, in vast numbers, in vast quantities, right? That's not really uh, come to clinical uh, use widespread, at least. It was used heavily in the, during the COVID epidemic uh, off-label because there's no RCTs to support it. But we didn't think it was really that helpful in the most sick patients in whom this would be utilized, which is, you know, patients with ARDS on uh, CRRT because that is too far gone. Okay, thank you. Uh, so thank you. On that uh, note, uh, because you spoke about polymyxin cartridges, do you think uh, charcoal cartridges have got any advantage over the regular ones? No, no, again, so these, these adsorptive therapies, right? You know, the, the problem is that they also adsorb good things, right? So, you know, so we, we don't know what's, what's in that soup that's helpful, what's harmful. Because you need you need these things to fight infections, for example, you know. But too much of a good thing is a bad thing. So just a non-specific, you know, blanket therapy is really not going to work. And you know, from an evolutionary standpoint, you know, AKI doesn't exist, right? You 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 know you 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 die before you get organ failure <laughs> of, by being eaten when you're slow, right? So there's no evolutionary you know uh, uh, reason why these why we, why you should live, you know. <laughs> Uh, when, when organ failure happens, because we have no mechanism to combat organ failure, heart failure, lung failure, kidney failure. There's, there's nothing there. So everything actually is designed to fight infection. That's the number one thing. So what we are basically seeing is a, a, a response to infection that has gone berserk because of, uh, you know, widespread activation of these inflammatory mechanisms. And then that's not because of per se from infection, but because it's a domino effect. Oh, Radha Krishna, it's your time now. Well, does it mean that the last uh, comment? No. <laughs> <laughs> I think the day is waiting for that to happen. And, you know, I, I, as a surgeon, I could understand mo most of what he spoke actually for the first time because nephrology is all you know Greek and Latin to me because we have very good nephrologists and any any change in neuron output any abnormal renal function, then, you know, the nephrologist is very much there. And we actually, we, we don't communicate much because actually we don't know what, what exactly what they happens. Do. <laughs> yeah, really, because, you know, <laughs> uh, the, if there's anything seriously wrong, they do tell us that, you know, things are not going fine. But otherwise, I mean, it's, it's a wonderful lecture and a real great discussion. And, you know, I think 
I really enjoyed the, the last hour and a half. Thank you. So did I. And it, it was really, you know, also to meet all of you after so many years. It is, it is it's a wonderful experience. Thanks to Zoom. Radha Krishna works in a tertiary care hospital where, you know, everything is there. But uh, more, as you are probably aware, 80% of surgeons in the country will not have a backup of that sort. And uh, they will be forced to manage, uh, uh, prevent and manage early AKI. And not everyone will be, every patient can be transported to a tertiary care hospital with a critical care nephrologist or, uh, you know, a, a, so that is that is the reason why uh, I was so keen that uh, you should do this uh, topic. So Lalit, did you do you want to say something? You turned your camera on. The mic is off. I turned my camera on to just show my face to Jay. Lalit, <laughs> <laughs> we are poles apart, so there is nothing I can add to that. He he was always where he was, the trailblazer. I'm still learning. I'm still following 0.5 mils per hour per kilogram. So, so good to see you. So good to see you. Uh, uh, any closing comments from you, Srinivas Prasad? Please unmute yourself. Definitely, I enjoyed the lecture, sir. I learned a lot. But still, uh, I do not know whether you will be able to follow this uh, uh, in the ICU to prevent uh, AK. Anyway, we'll try to. Vidya, Naveen can come in for a while. Naveen? Uh, there's also another question. Is it very, I, I thought it was very interesting. Is it necessary that a sepsis patient have hemodynamic compromise to have AKI? No, no, absolutely not. So if you remember the picture I showed you, you can get microvascular compromise without a drop in blood pressure. Well, that's the first stage. That's why the lactate goes up before you go into septic shock, right? And that's why we use lactate as an, as an independent endpoint to... Uh, in terms of fluid and uh, pressure uh, resuscitation, well before the blood pressure goes down. So, uh, Naveen runs a hospital in uh, rural Andhra Pradesh and uh, he's doing great work during COVID and I'm sure he's forced to look after all kinds of patients. Uh, Naveen, do you have a question for Jay? Thanks, Naveen, for the, for the work. Uh, Naveen, are you there? Must be starting his night shift for COVID. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he, he was there for a while. We'll see. He's muted. Hi, Jay. Hi, Naveen. <laughs> Hi, long time. So many decades. I think 40 years. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. You still uh, look the same. <laughs> no, no, no. That's that's a compliment, I know. But, you know what can I tell you? <laughs> yeah. So nice to see, uh, listen to your talk, Jay. It's wonderful. Thank you. And um, even an orthopedic surgeon could understand your uh, presentation. <laughs> <laughs> you have scored a mega hit. You got through to a GI surgeon and an orthopedic surgeon. <laughs> I have to count it as a success. Yeah. Thank you. Naveen, do you have any questions? Yeah, I no, just wanted to just um, uh, appreciate the work he has uh, been doing there and the presentation. See, most of the... Um, Orthopedic surgeons are blamed actually for this kidney injuries or whatever you call this, <laughs> over uh, drugging and over uh, NSAIDs and all that. So where can uh, we put a stop to this? Is there a way to stop this? No, no. So I think this this thing about risk stratification is key. So if you see a patient, say, with, with an orthopedic condition, right? And they, they've come in, they don't give you a history, but if you know they have diabetes, one should check a creatinine, one should just review the medications. So someone who's an older person on a non-steroidal, you know, long-term is immediately at risk for an AKI with any procedure. So those medicines need to be stopped before procedure. And when you reintroduce them, just be extremely careful about the volume status that they are eating and drinking and you're not losing blood, <laughs> tons of blood post-procedure when you give them the first shot of Toradol or, you know, the injectable NSAID. So I think the use of NSAIDs has to be in the setting of uh, volume status being good. So there's any compromise in the volume status, try to avoid the NSAID. And I think that's the only preventive thing that really, really works is, is, to, is to just look at the patient to make sure they're not volume depleted. 
most people, even with kidney disease, can take a an few doses of NSAID, yeah, despite everyone saying don't do it, without much of a problem, as long as they're not volume depleted, as long as they're not taking a dose of yeah. ACE inhibitors or ARPs. So, and that is that is one uh, critical aspect of, uh, because these drugs are really, really useful for pain control. And uh, one needs to use them judiciously. That's all. Namandran? Yes, me Pachepan. Um, yeah, it's okay. Uh, I, I just, uh, you, you know, uh, Jai, thank you so much. It's been a fantastic presentation and great to see you after such a long time. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, you know, talking about the prevention, uh, you know, we, we had a spate of uh, urology post-operative patients in our ICU. And uh, they all had normal kidney function to start with. And then they developed uh, some, some, some sepsis, some infection. And then they started developing, you know, acute kidney injury, secondary to sepsis. And then, and then we found out that many of them were uh, you know, contracting this multidrug resistant gram negative sepsis, mostly Klebsiella. And then, and then after extensive uh, thing, we, fo <clears throat> we found out that they were actually contracting it in the washroom that they were using. And, and after using touch point cleaning in, in, in all the parts, wherever the patient goes and touches, wherever everyone uh, you know, touches, we, we actually eliminated uh, you know, this type of uh, you know, acute kidney injury post-operatively because once once a patient is ambulant and then they want to use the washroom, they, they, they go and touch this this part and oh. that part and, and then they contract this 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 infection. And and because because Naveen was asking about you know how to how to prevent, I thought I I would discuss our experience about this touch point cleaning in the ICU. No, that, that's fantastic. And also the one thing I didn't mention for uh, sepsis is, the, yeah. you know, the usage of ca Foley catheters, which, you know, every mm. patient who goes into the hospital, which I've heard, immediately gets a Foley catheter for unknown reasons, right? And they come out always with urosepsis. So that, I think, is a very important point as in terms of prevention. That, you know, unless the, fo unless the patient is retaining, there is absolutely no reason to stick a Foley catheter. Even for urine monitoring, you can use a quantum catheter. There's no use, no reason to put a holy catheter in an average anesthesia procedure. Or, or uh, if you're critically ill and you, you're on presses, yes, there's a need for a holy catheter. But so, for example, if you're annually on CRT, you just pull out the catheter and do a bladder ultrasound every couple of days. So this holy catheter is a big source of sepsis, and this MDR is especially common because of widespread use of quinolones and other, you know, outpatient antibiotics for everything, right? So, so antibiotic stewardship has to be put into every hospital management system, you know, for any, any, any hospitals, because that's the single most important reason why all these MDRs are, sp are spreading wide, you know, fast. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, your closing comments, Tejo. Thank you very much, sir. It was a very interesting talk. I am pretty happy I stayed up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thanks for the opportunity, and uh, you know I'll definitely tune into some of these talks because it looks like it's a very vibrant audience, and I'm sure the talks are also very exciting. So, and if it's at this time, only promise it's in the middle of my day, so I have to be on vacation or something <laughs> to be able to listen. <laughs> that, that, that's why I asked for your appointment two months in advance, uh, Jay, <laughs> so that you could move your schedule. So, um, uh, so that's one of the reasons why uh, people. Uh, you know, from the North American area, have find it difficult to join us because of the timing. Uh, but uh, thanks very much, Jim, for uh, clearing your schedule to be able to attend this uh, uh, session. And uh, thanks for an enlightening lecture. And uh, our USP of uh, marvelous medicine is that uh, the discussion lasts longer than the talk. <laughs> That's the way it should be. And no, it no be. question is left unanswered. No question is too stupid to be asked, and uh, uh, you know every question is uh, addressed. So uh, thanks, uh, Srinivas Prasad and uh, Tejaswini, and especially Tejaswini for staying up so late uh, in uh, Australia. Uh, thank you, one and all, for joining. And uh, on this occasion of uh, Doctor's Day, let's hope that uh, uh, the the next year we see no violence against doctors and. Uh, we don't have any COVID deaths because of uh, giving care to COVID patients. Uh, thank you everyone for joining and uh, we'll meet again next week with yet another episode of uh, Marvelous Medicine at 8 p.m. on Thursday. Good night. And thank you. Bye. Good night. Bye.